there are two classes of these. These are phosphoglycerides. Now, the phosphoglycerides are kind of the more, uh, I don't want to say they're the more common, but the more readily talked about structures here. And they're made out of three things as well as the sphingolipids. This is a glycerol, backbone, some fatty acid tails, and then usually a phosphorylated alkyl. Two fatty acid groups plus a glycerol backbone, which I'm going to color coordinate that in white as well, and a phosphorylated alcohol. All right, so the glycerol backbone is exactly what it was in the last two. We have for ourselves three carbon atoms all attached to each other. Some hydrogen groups here for the first two. And then whereas if I were drawing a triglyceride, I would have kept going in this direction, but it's a kind of a, like an inverted side there on the third one. And for this third one, it is connected to, well, I'll draw the fatty acids first. Um, so fatty acids connection here. Um, if we were just kind of draw these, imagine them acting as nucleophiles. Um, if I could fit these, I know this is not uh, thermodynamically, I should be drawing them pointing downward, but uh, this saves a lot of space. <laughs> so I'm going to draw them like this. So these are the, the carbonyl uh, groups of the fatty acid tails. Remember how we talked about that those are formed by dehydration synthesis reactions. And then for the phosphoryl alcohol group, I'm doing that in green. Um, this is connected uh, kind of like this, I'm drawing these as the resonance hybrids of the individual ones. I'm not going to draw the lone pairs, um, that's just implied. Uh, and then there's this oxygen here, and then attached to this is usually, um, I'll switch to it in blue, just to say that this can be whatever. Um, what, what's attached to that, that's, that's not a, a constant. That, that can be a variable region there. But for the most part, for phosphoglycerides, this is your constant regions, right? Some things we want to just know that we want to make is that, um, I'll do it in blue, is that all of this right here, all of this is an ester, is, is at least in our context, is formed by an ester linkage, right? Phospho, diester linkage, and then the ester linkages themselves. So ester linkage, right? And ester linkages are really, really stable, right? So if something is really stable, it's not going to be highly reactive, right? Which is good because this is what's making the phospholipid bilayer that's holding together my skin right now. It's not reacting with the oxygen in the air. It's not reacting with the water in the air. It's relatively unreactive. You have to use really powerful substances if you want to react with this. Now, there's a scene in one of my favorite TV shows, and I'm probably going to have an NSA agent watching this right now, so understand this is totally for educational purposes. But there's a scene in Breaking Bad where they kill someone and they have to digest the body. And I always thought that was kind of inaccurate because they use hydrofluoric acid, one, which is a weak acid. Uh, but two, I wouldn't use an acid. I would use something that would be readily acts as a nucleophile, a strong nucleophile, to uh, attack these uh, carbonyl carbons here in the process of soponification. But that takes a really strong substance to do that, a really strong basic substance, like really strong lye. To, to break down uh, ester linkages. So, yeah, really stable, right? Some other things that we want to note about this is for things like archaea or uh, even bacteria that are real extremophiles. And uh, in this context, we're really just talking about archaea. Um, if you go back to my microbiology playlist, you can find out about them. Um, some things that we want to note is that they have really branched fatty acid tails. And they have an even more stable than an ester is a ether linkage. And, you know, uh, an ether is technically polar, yes, but it's so stable. Uh, I almost in visual, in, in visualize them being nonpolar, like so like methionine. Methionine is considered a nonpolar amino acid despite the fact that it contains an ether linkages because biochemists are not nearly as big of the pricks as chemists are. So ether linkage is even more stable. So it's more unreactive, right? And the branching here can actually have methyl groups here that make it uh, resistant to oxidation. So I'm just going to abbreviate that as they're very slowly oxidized. And so that's why uh, archaea can survive inside of like, like lava. Like they found an archaea that survives in the magma of lava. Like that's insane to me. Um, but anyways, so sphingolipids are made up of three structures as well. A sphingosine, a fatty acid, and then a phosphorylated choline. So for example, that I'm going to draw first, um, for this at least, would be sphingomyelin. Um, this is the part that's used for the myelin sheath of our neurons that acts as a very good insulator, it's a very good conductor. Um, sphingosine structure is pretty straightforward, but I'm going to draw it again, like I said, 
as a part of sphingomyelin. So for sphingosin, we have a methyl group, and attached to that methyl group is a long series of completely uh, saturated hydrocarbon chain there. In this case, in the context of the book gives us is that it's a 12 set there. Um, and then attached to that hydrocarbon chain is a, oh my gosh, what type of a bond is this? A trans bond. Trans bond. But it's not a part, contributing to the part of the actual structure there. Right, it's a very controlled substance if you can think about it. Um, and then we have kind of coming out at us in the plane if you think of it as a wedge here. I'll color it in. You know what? Coloring it in looks really ugly. I probably shouldn't have done that. Is an OH group, right? So it's an alcohol. And then in the back we have a hydrogen. And then coming up here, coming out at us, out at us from the plane, I got to finish what I started, but I don't wish I hadn't done that, um, is an amide group. It's usually an NH3 in sphingosine, but since I'm drawing sphingomyelin, it's going to be uh, in the format of an amide bond there. Attached to that, we have another CH2 there with an oxygen attached to it. So that's it for the backbone of sphingosine that's playing a role in this. Now the fatty acid, um, this is in the process, ah gosh, hopefully I can fit this in here. But so what type of bond is this? This is an amide bond. This is an amide bond. This is so very stable, very not going to have a lot of rotation. This is the same thing as a peptide bond we talked about our uh, protein lectures. So this right here, this, this oxygen here is going to form a bond with the phosphate group, uh, which is going to form the part of the uh, phosphoropoline. I'm keeping it in the resonance hybridized form here. All right, so nitrogen with a positive formal charge and then three methyl groups branching off of it. And that's our structure of sphingomyelin. I'm making sure, note that I'm um, calling, calling it as I see it, right? So this is, this whole thing here is sphingomyelin. This part here is the sphingosine. This would be an NH3 if I wanted to make this sphingosine. And this would be an OH if this was sphingosine as well. But because of this, the NH3 here was reacting to form an amide bond here. Uh, I'm just going to, yes, I'll draw it in uh, blue that we have some amide bonds here. The bond connecting these two here is an amide, an amide bond there. And then the bond that's connecting this to the uh, sphingosine to the phosphorylcholine is a, a phosphodiester. So one of the things that I always teach for students um, in this class and really in any biology class is that if you're going to put the effort into making a covalent bond, that's going to be a very stable structure. That's very metabolically taxing. That's a very something we're going to have to invest in energetically speaking. And so that's how sphingolipids work um, with with that structure there.